the stick episode two mm, baby give me the stick yeah for sean Ooh, baking how i love Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and welcome to episode two of The Stig, where we take a irreverent look at the material that was produced in the TIG, which has been archived, so that you don't have to suffer the tedium of reading it for yourself, but rather you can be entertained whilst educated as I dive in there for you. We go back now to the first item of today's episode, which was originally written in June 2014. And this time, it's about makeup. How fascinating. The blog entry reads as follows. Beauty. Rachel Zane Beauty. The article commences. Zane. Rachel Zane. So already we have her embodying James Bond's traditional entry, as if to equate herself with the worldwide and world-famous spy. Zane, Rachel Zane, the savvy paralegal lawyer, in training, confidant to Donna and Lewis, lady to Mike, Mr. Mike Ross on Suits. No idea who these people are, never watched it, never will. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the law. Right. Stop there. If you're a paralegal and you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the law, then why aren't you an attorney, solicitor, or a barrister? You don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the law. Nobody does. Take a QC that has been in practice for many, many years. They will know much about the law of their area of specialism, but they are not expected to be walking encyclopedias. They have LexisNexis that they'll utilise to look things up. They'll have law reports that they'll go to. They know where to find the answers and invariably use uh, less senior members of chambers or the practice in which they're working to undertake the research. The law is an amorphous beast. That's why these lawyers are so fucking expensive to begin with. But to suggest that she has an encyclopedic knowledge of the law is grandiosity. Of course, Harry's wife likes to think that she has an encyclopedic knowledge of everything because, as you know, she's an expert on anything. Whatever she turns her hand to, she knows it inside out. But it gets better. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the law, an ambition that trumps well, Trump himself. That doesn't even make sense. Um, an ambition that trumps Trump. But she's a paralegal. Trump's not a lawyer. He's a businessman and former president. Of course, at that juncture, um, he wasn't president. He was just a uh, presidential candidate. But... To talk about trumping Trump himself doesn't even make sense, so that's just a load of nonsense. Anyway, let's carry on. And a closet that rivals Olivia Palermo's or Lauren Santo Domingo, depending on who you fawn over. And despite her evolution as a character, it's the makeup and hair. The classic Zane style. Is there is there a classic Zane style? Does she think she's now touting the Rachel as per Jennifer Aniston's hairdo from Friends? She clearly does think that she's in the same league, admittedly, because apparently there's this classic Zane style. If you were to say to me, HG, what do you think about the classic H the classic Zane style? I would say, after taking a sip of my tea, I would say to you, do you mean Billy Zane, who's in Titanic? 
I don't know any other Zanes off the top of my head. Did you mean Inzane, that lunatic down the road? No, Rachel Zane. Who the fuck's that? So what is this classic Zane style? But apparently it's rarely changed in four seasons of playing Rachel. In honour of the season premiere tonight, the season that I am over the moon to be part of, I'm surprised actually you haven't written that the season is over the moon that you're in it, such as your deluded sense of grandiosity, that I'm clinking glasses to celebrate. I'm revealing the secrets. Ooh, the daily ritual that my suit's makeup artist, Ms. Sandra Wheatle, uses to take me from the girl with the bare face to Ms. Rachel Elizabeth Zane. Happy shopping and cheers to many more seasons of Suits. And as you'll see popping up on your screen, we're treated to the various aspects of the makeup that goes to create apparently this classic Rachel Zane and there's the Giorgio Armani Silk Foundation plug Mac give me some sun hmm? what Nars blush orgasm what on earth is this Clarins instant light rose shimmer is that called orgasm the Nars blush it looks like it is interesting Mac eyeliner Chanel eyeliner Lancome, Hypnese, Mascara, Shoe, Emura, Eyelash Curler, and so on and so forth. So, plug of the products there, no doubt looking for freebies, residual benefit, assertion of control through this article, and of course, facade management of being on trend and perfect. And now, as you'll see, we are treated to, yes, the makeup session itself, and there she is, glancing up at the camera to say, look, here I am having some makeup applied to my face. Not the first time I wager that she's been caught in that position looking at the camera as something is applied to her face. Then the next picture, it looks like blowing kisses while some member of the crew behind us thinking, for fuck's sake, will you get on with it? We've got a schedule to keep to. And then attempting to look sultry and sexy, reclining on a sofa. And it's her on the set of suits, if we didn't know um, why she has to tell us it's her. We know, we know, unfortunately, who you are. So that's the first Ascent 9 part, but unbelievably so. Yes, I know, you're finding it hard to believe, aren't you? We're going to move on to next. Now, what would it be? We started off with makeup. In episode one, we got a bit of sort of holiday and travel combined with Fashan. Will she be going to Fashan? Perhaps back to travel. No! It's baking. Mmm. One of the most boring topics that one can come across. But I'm sure that Harry's wife will make it sparkle and glisten. So, what does she write? Well, apparently this is all about chocolate petit gâteau. Oh, how I love the ritual of cooking. Baking, not so much. There's something about the technicality of it that stifles my inner rebel. <laughs> Okay. No dash of this, or extra spoonful of that. Yes, you think you're like the Jackson Pollock of cookery, don't you? Throw it in there and chuck that on and smother it in this and smear it with that and layer it with the other. That's how you think that the cooking is done, because you have that inner rebel. Of course, what's interesting is this. As you know, baking is a science. If you don't follow the precise ingredients, the cake won't bake. With cooking, you've got more latitude and leeway. And her comment there actually belies the threat to control that's posed by the scientific method of baking, that she can't do as she wants. And of course, she doesn't realise this, but her narcissism shines through there by talking about the fact that it's a constraint upon her. And she's correct where she states that there's a science to baking and the measurements matter ever so much. Yes, they do. Suffice to say, when I do decide to make a go of the whole baking thang, Jesus, it needs to be worth it. It needs to be soul-satisfying, like a good hug on a bad day. Hmm. Pretentious much? And clearly it needs to taste unquestionably delicious. Oh, no, I thought most people 
Harry's wife, when they engaged in baking, was, I want this to basically taste like a decomposing corpse. Or maybe feces. That's something I'm really going for. I'm looking for rotten egg combined with monkey feces when it comes to this particular... Of course it's meant to be unquestionably delicious. Idiot. Be it Valentine's Day or any other day, where you want to treat yourself or your honey, nauseating, to a little, well, sugar, this chocolate cake, with its gooey centre and picture-perfect presentation, is a no-brainer. All my baking quandaries go out of the window when I roll up my sleeves to make this one. What are baking quandaries? Can somebody enlighten me? Hello. Do you suffer from baking quandaries? Do you find that there are many questions surrounding your baking activity in the kitchen? Have you or a member of your family suffered a baking quandary in the last three years? Well, if you have, there is help at hand. Where there is blame, there is a claim. Ring this number, 1-800-FUCKING-NONSENSE, and ask for Nobby Conquer Bollocks, who will aid you in your baking quandary solutions. What the dickings is she going on about? Apparently one serves this with ice cream, fresh berries, or just perfectly on its own. And then you get the directions about how to make the chocolate petit gâteau. And in brackets it actually states this, as instructed by Harry's wife. So it's not enough to say directions. And... The natural assumption would be, of course, that this is coming from her on her own blog. So they're obviously her directions. She has to spell it out, which demonstrates grandiosity, but also treating her readers as epsilon semi-morons. And then, basically, you're told to preheat the oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you melt the butter and the chocolate together. You combine the eggs, the egg yolk and sugar together in a mixing bowl and beat for three minutes until light and fluffy. You fold the flour and the chocolate. You pour into two to three inch cake moulds rimmed with greased parchment paper, as in the side image, or individual ramekins, as in the photo above. You bake for six to eight minutes, or until the edges are set and the middle is still soft. You want the centre to be a gooey. So I would stick to about six minutes, since they will continue cooking from their own heat, even when you pull them from the oven. Carefully lift cake moulds and remove parchment liner, unless in ramekins, in which case you're all set. Sprinkle with powdered sugar or fresh berries if desired, then serve immediately, immediately, with ice cream. Are you all set now, Tudorites, to go and do a little bit of baking action of your chocolate petit gâteau, or would you like some more stig nonsense? I hear you want the stig nonsense very well. I shall indulge you. So where do we go to next? We've started off with makeup. We've gone into the baking. Really has to be only one place that the icon of all matters. Fridge by Valentino. Kermit goes to church. Overripe burst tomato. Chairman Mao bounces the berry through Harlem. Yes, you've guessed it. It's for Sean. And here, for Sean, five story. I have to be honest when I say that I don't really remember playing dress up as a little girl. Probably a lie in a revision of history. No vivid memories of twirling in front of the mirror or sliding into my mum's heels. The irony of this is noteworthy, given my job on Suits, where, yes, we act. Fuck me! Do you? Never have realised. I mean, I know there are some actors and actresses who just play themselves, but generally we do get it that it's not real. Again, treating our audience in a condescending fashion. Where, yes, we act, and, yes, we emote. But we also play some serious dress-up. For Sean is the name of the game, and on a daily basis, I slip into countless bespoke frocks pulled by the keen eye of our wardrobe designer, Jolie Andreata. This includes everything, from a Tom Ford skirt to a vintage Chanel eyelet lace blouse, both of which cost more than twice a month's rent. <laughs> Look at that foreshadowed residual benefit. 
but this is still work. And at the end of the day, the clothes come off my body, indeed they do, the mattress actress, and back into that glorious wardrobe department. My Cinderella moment is done. False humility. So on this rainy afternoon on Manhattan's Upper East Side, I enter Claire Austenfields, it looks like. You should know, uh, valued viewers, that as I'm reading, when it comes to people's names, they're in beige, which on a white background makes them often rather difficult to discern, hence why I pause. So she enters Cla Claire Ostenfeldt's jewel box, five-story, and decides to play real-life dress-up. Curated, there it is. <coughs> that stupid fucking word. Curated by Claire, the beauty rocking, those general emerald green pants and the Polaroid on the right, Five Story is filled with the likes of Peter Pilotto, Carvin, Alexander Wang, Jason Wu, Thakun, Kushni et Ox, and frankly, every other coveted label that a fashionista fawns over. So another plug, in the hope of getting freebies, no doubt, residual benefits. I wanted to put together a lug that could go from day to night, and that would make me feel like a lady. So with a few pulls and an accessory change, handbag, shoes, jewellery, we took two simple pieces from a walk in the park to cocktail party chic. Okay. And you will now have the benefit of seeing what was placed on the blog in terms of some pictures. And there's something around her neck with a slight pouty-pouty, mouthy, open why that's needed. Perhaps she's having difficulty breathing because of the stench of her own bullshit. Then holding something or other up. Is it a bag or something? Can't really tell. She looks to the side. Why are you looking to the side? Why don't you look straight forward? Then barefooted, laughing, uh, adopting the I'm waiting for a train pose again. And then the final picture. Well, I'm slightly lost there. She looks like she might have nits as she's scratching her head and also is lifting one leg up. Is this meant to be sort of some kind of sexy pose? Here I am with my hair a little bit sort of um, tousled and I'm um, lifting a leg as if I'm being provocative but not allowing you to see all of my suspiciously thin thigh whereas I'm holding some kind of clutch bag there. Strange picture indeed. And that's the extent of the fashion that is provided. And there are details provided as to what the relevant items are but I really can't be asked to explain that any further because it's quite simply tedious and boring there are some other pictures as well but again i'm really not interested in displaying them but what this demonstrates of course is this preoccupation this delusion of being this fashionista that she sits there thinking the world is reading everything that she has to write and it is all so important and meaningful well you can now try and Rouse yourselves from a catatonic, catatonic state after having to be put through that nauseating nonsense. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening. <laughs>